Tesla recently released this video showing the progress that Optimus has been making. You can see here that it's using an end-to-end -end neural network, and it was trained to sort these battery cells. It runs in real time on the FSD computer, and it only uses 2D cameras, tactile, and force sensors. Optimus balances on its legs while the net drives the entire upper body. You can see here that precise movements are required with very little margin of error because you can see the holes is actually almost like an exact fit for these cells. And it can actually automatically figure out the next location it needs to put the cells in. And if it fails, it can automatically recover from the failures. All of this data is collected via human teleoperation. And you can see here that you have a bunch of robots working together at the same time. And all of this is also being tested in their factory for a more realistic setting. And not much human intervention has been required, so it looks like it's pretty promising. And you can see here that um, they've also been training the robot to walk around. So again, they have a separate neural network for the arm movement and the body, uh, the lower body and this, the duration of it has been way longer, so it seems like it's making a lot of progress. And maybe one day we'll see it in actual production settings soon, so looking forward to that. But if we go on and we can see um, later on, we are going to look into these different topics. So throughout the video, it mentions a lot of buzzwords or certain things that can seem a little bit ambiguous, but the purpose of this video is for me to have a deep dive into all of these concepts and hopefully you'll get a better understanding of what this update really means. So if we take a look at this part, this part says end-to-end -end neural network was trained to sort battery cells. Okay, so the term end-to-end -end neural network has been um, said pretty often nowadays, especially with FSD, but what does that really mean? So the idea is you have inputs. So there's three inputs to this neural network. You have video frames, tactile sensor, and force sensor, and your output is motor angles. So by this end-to-end, -end, what it means is you only have certain inputs and outputs and nothing else in between. It's just one main neural network, because previously they would break it down into specific tasks, especially for FSD. But this makes it a more simplified approach because this end-to-end -end neural network acts a lot like the way the human brain works because the human brain has only one central brain and everything is processed through that brain. So you kind of treat this end-to-end -end neural network like a human brain, essentially. So they also mention learning. Uh, a lot of times when they say learning, what that actually means is the training process. So you actually want to find the weights inside of these uh, circles here. So depending on what the weights are, the model would have different behaviors. And all of these um, weights that are found is done offline. So after you get enough training data, your model will predict a certain way. So when they say run in real time, that's the actual prediction. So we've determined the model weights from training. And then when you're actually running in real time, you'll take an actual image feed of what you see here. So you can see that this is the actual image feed. And they'll feed it into the model plus some force values. So maybe like one newton meter or uh, for the force or whatnot. You have the tactile and the force sensor. And the output will be the angle. So you'll have like angles of each joint moving. And you have the fingers here too with some joints that are moving as well. And right now it's just using one arm, but the idea is you have all of these joints that move together to produce a motion based off of the input and it's running in real time. So it also mentions 2D cameras. So the reason why it mentions 2D cameras is because typically um, when they're doing things like controlling robots with the environment, what they'll typically use is a 3D camera. So um, 3D camera, what it is, is usually this is like an example of a Kinect, but the idea is you will have uh, typical 2D cameras here, but they'll have an extra sensor, usually some IR sensor, to project dots, and then from the dots, you'll get the depth map. So this one is a depth map, and I have a video that goes into details of that, so you could check it out. But once you get the depth map, you'll get the point cloud. So there's a whole process of extracting your image feed and getting a point cloud. And then from there, you could understand how to manipulate your objects. So they stress the term 
2D specifically because they're trying to emphasize that they're no longer using a point cloud, but rather just treating it as human vision. So that's really the main significance of this. So that's why they say 2D. And then next up, you want to see that they mention tactile sensor. Okay, so tactile sensor, what that is, is it senses contact with the object. So when you're picking up objects, like, you know, especially in the case where they have the cells, and if they're trying to grip on it, they need to know when they actually make contact with the cells before they can uh, pinch it up and bring it up, right? So there's a lot of different type of sensors out there, but typically there's uh, two directions of sensing that you want to sense. You have what's called the normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface. So in this case, you can imagine you have a thumb here. So the normal force will be perpendicular to your thumb. And then you have what's called a shear force, which is going to be tangent to your thumb. So uh, tangent is usually to measure uh, slippage. So this one is for slip. And then you have the normal force, which will tell you your compression, so how hard you're squeezing an object. So all of these can work in unison to determine the type of uh, contact you have with an object to give feedback to a robot, how they're actually interacting with the environment. Okay, so uh, next up, we want to see the force sensor. That's another term that they use. So force sensor, usually they, they typically put the force sensor somewhere at the end here. I don't know where this robot has it, but I would say this is a pretty good location to put a force torque sensor. And usually these uh, force sensors, also known as uh, force torque sensors, FT, and usually they'll have uh, six axes of sensing. So you may have like a X, Y, and Z. So you can sense forces in all three directions. But then the other three is actually the rotation about the three axes. So that's how you get all six degrees of freedom for the sensing. And what this allows is uh, when you actually place the cell into the hole here, so you have a cell that you're trying to place in, when you actually place it in, you could feel the contact it has with the environment, so specifically the contact between the cell and the hole. So this force sensor can allow the Tesla bot to feel that interaction. So that's going to play an important role for that. So next up, we want to take a look at this clip here where they're actually saying precise movement are required with very little margin during insertion. Okay, so what does that really mean? So when I mention uh, very little margin during insertion, it really goes back to the peg in the hole problem. So it's a classical problem where they have to control the robot and place a peg inside a hole. So the reason why this is such a hard task is because Usually, a hole like this and a peg like this, um, there's a really tight tolerance. So in certain cases, it might be like plus or minus 0 0.001 or even tighter if they're trying to do like a slip fit. I don't think these cells are nearly as tight, but it's a similar problem that they're trying to tackle is to try to place something in a tight fitting location. So they actually bypass all of this uh, architecture that is previously required. They probably... In, in this example here, they probably need a whole uh, control architecture to implement it. There's many implementations out there, but here using the end-to-end -end neural network, they could just do everything from one go just based off of the three inputs and control the motor angle. So that's really the main significance is because the classical approach has always been uh, pretty hard and requires a lot of components to actually make that work. So now let's take a look at this next part that I mentioned. Uh, the neural net automatically targets the next free slot. So why is this part significant? So if you want to think about the classical approach, uh, typically what will happen is you will want to define a frame uh, for all the hole locations, right? And then you may want to do some like circle detection to figure out all the different locations of each one. And you may want to label like one, two, three, four, and so on. So it's a whole process of first determining the location of the holes. And then from there, you have to have some planner where you have like the tool end, and then you have to generate a trajectory for each hole. But because all of this, you can imagine um, this whole task that's being implemented, you could just tell the Tesla bot like, okay, 
take all the cells and fill it into this empty bin, it'll just go without having to pre-plan each of these trajectories and do all this identification of the cell location. So that's the main significance of it saying that it's all automatic. So it's a huge jump from previous uh, methods out there. Now if we took a look, take a look at this part, it says the training data was collected via human teleoperation. So what is the main significance of this part? So here you can see an example. So uh, you can imagine the, the key word here is teleoperation. So it's controlled by a human, uh, but there's actually more to it. So you can see here that uh, they're wearing a VR headset. So this is probably what's happening is the robot has a vision here and the vision is being uh, transferred from the robot to the human. And then here he's wearing a special glove. So the glove here might have some frame, okay? So this might be like uh, T human. And then here the robot itself, the robot hand has some frame and this might be called T, uh, let's call this T robot. So the idea of teleoperation is you have some transform between the human and the robot and this transform will figure out some uh, motion and then from there, it's going to translate to joint angles. So typically, this will have some world frame. You might have like another frame uh, somewhere here, for example, and it's keeping track of this change, change in transform. So you want to see how much the human hand is moving relative to some starting location. So the idea is you might have, uh, you, you might have like a human here, right? So you might have a human. And then you're going to have some four kinematics for the human. That's based on how the hand is moving. moving. And then you do some teleop calculations here to uh, figure out the relationship between the robot and the human. And then from there, it's going to feed into some IK solver. So this IK solver is going to spit out the angles. And then this will finally go to the robot. So there's a lot of pieces to it. You have four kinematics, which answers the questions of given some uh, joint angles, what is my position or my transform? And then the IK problem is given some transform, what are my angles? Because ultimately to control the robot, you need to feed in the angles at each joint. But here specifically for the human, uh, there's not really any joint angles per se. Although it could, it could measure the finger angles, so there might be some sensing there. So there could be potential angles, but the absolute location of that uh, is not going to be relying on angles because at least from this image here, I don't see any angles being detected. So all of this might be a pure vision uh, type of uh, computation to figure out the transform of the location of the hand. But the actual fingers, I think the gloves could potentially have uh, sensors for each finger, and then from there it could determine the angles of each finger. So going through this whole process of four kinematics, teleop, and inverse kinematics, it could actually go ahead and control the robot and generate uh, all the data. So from the data, the main thing that it needs to have is the, the different things that we mentioned earlier, like the video feed, the force sensing, and the force torque sensing, and then also you have the tactile sensing, and then the output is just going to be all of that. It's going to be the angles, which is ultimately the motion that we see the robot is, is doing. Okay, So hopefully you got a better understanding of what's going on. And if you found this help video helpful, give a like and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.